Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. This is the Steve Austin Show. I'm rolling sound. I'm here at 317 Gimmick Street, the podcast studio. Lacey Bonner just rolled in. How are you? I'm great. Well, Traffic you, sucks, but I'm good. You're drinking, oh, what can I be drinking? This is Big Wave Golden <laughs> Ale. It's like, it tastes like a lager, but it has a little more flavor. Like so it. what kind of beer are you into? I stay away from like Bud Lights and things like that. I like, uh, like good, like the brew, good brew, like uh, Oktoberfest kind of beers, Hefenweiser's. I didn't fancy you a beer drinker. Oh yeah. And a whiskey, beer and whiskey. Man, I was, I was sitting there trying to think of a way to frame up this conversation. I was thinking to myself, okay. Here's this young lady. She's 31 years old. She's beautiful. She's got the Von Eric name, uh, third generation. And but when I start doing my research and I'm starting to look at all the dates, it's like it's just a long obituary. Yeah. And I, obviously, there's many high spots in your life, and you're yeah. young, and you have three kids, and everything's going great for you. But along the way, there's a lot of tragedy. Yeah. So That's I why just... I started wrestling. It's actually why I got into wrestling was for therapy. I was smart. I had my own advertising company. I owned it for eight years. I had 68 employees. Like, I... What, well, did you go to college? I didn't. So how do you have 68 employees without going to college and you have I made it up. I was a realtor in South Beach at 18. I got my real estate license in two weeks, passed the test. And um, I couldn't get anyone to, you know, let me sell their house. So I made up this credit card type of thing, and I put their, you know, their name and their, um, you know, their business card on one side. And on the other side, I went to all these local businesses and asked them, you give me 500 bucks, I'll put a discount and your logo on there, and you'll go to, you know, the entire hospital. Like, there's a hospital. And I was like, I'm going to put it in all of their HR things, so their paychecks, basically, right? right? And it was going to um, 30,000 people. And I would give it to all thirty thousand if they if they gave me five hundred bucks for that spot. And the realtors paid three grand to be on the other side. And so uh, it was called accent advertising. I just made it up. And, and that then was I did in South Beach. The US. Yeah. What the hell were you doing in South Beach? Because you were born in Dallas, right? Yep. Um, I had a boyfriend. Oh God, he was so terrible. He's a bodybuilder. You know, I guess stay away from those guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bodybuilders almost like the boys. I mean, when I, when I say the boys, I mean the wrestlers. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I mean that. I mean that. In a, I mean that in a good way. But I mean, there's there's some baggage that can come. Totally, with I that liked lifestyle. him because he looked like daddy, and so I was like, oh, he must be a good guy. No, there's there's only one daddy. So anyway, I ran away from him because he asked me to marry him, and he was so horrible. And I was like, the only way I'm going to leave this guy is if I leave the state. And my girlfriend was a Victoria's Secret model in South Beach, so I called her and I was like, let's. Let's move in together. So I moved into a model's apartment, stayed on a little love seat. Still in Florida? In Florida. This yeah. is in South Beach. So I, I had a one-way ticket and $40, and I became a real estate agent in two weeks. Had someone sponsor me to be a realtor. Went to Douglas Elliman and then started my own company and made all my own money. Got out of there. Had a beautiful, like, penthouse apartment, floor-to-ceiling windows, spent like five grand a month on that and I was 18 years old. Jesus. <laughs> so then you started getting the wrestling business? No. So Vince called me one day. And I heard I, okay, about Okay, so I met this guy. I really want to start off this question. <laughs> I met this guy there in South Beach. He, his name was Daniel. He was, cheers, by the way. Cheers. I'm only going to drink one beer with you. I'm trying to cut back. So I met this guy who had an English accent and a Mercedes. And I was like, ooh, yeah. Anyway, he got pregnant because he was hot. So you were trying to get pregnant. <laughs> no, I was 18. No, I was 19 when I got pregnant. I was 20 when the baby came. Before the market crashes, you find out you're pregnant. Are you happy or oh, yeah. nervous? Oh, no, I was happy. I'm born to be a mom. Okay. I'm so motherly. So the market crashed. I had a baby, and I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? Vince calls me, and he's like, do you want to be a wrestler or diva? And I said, Vince, what the hell is a diva? And he goes, it's a girl wrestler. That's what we call them now. <laughs> and so he flew me out, and I was backstage, and, you know, I smelt the bin gay, and it's all the guys taping up, and I was like, oh, my God, this is my childhood. And Flashback. I just, oh, I just started bawling. I was crying so hard, and there was all these radio stations there trying to interview me, and I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't talk. Was it that bad? It was so bad. 
it was, it, but at that moment, I knew that I had held everything inside my whole life. And if I got into the business, it would release all of these horrible, bad emotions that I had inside that I hadn't been addressing. And so I signed the contract that night. But How much really... thought did you put into that before you signed it, Lacey? Zero. Zero right. thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I got there, I never, I did, never paid a, like, paid a bill. Dan Daniel at, in Miami helped me with that. I never paid taxes. I didn't know. I didn't have a bank account. I didn't have an ID anymore. I lost it. Nothing. So, and I had a baby and I was single and they put me in this apartment. It was two bedroom and they could not give me direct deposit. So they'd give me these checks and I'd have to, I didn't have a car. So I'd have to rollerblade with my child all the way to like a check cashing spot. And they'd have to look me up on the internet, Lacey Von Eric, to see my name because I didn't have an ID. Needless to say, I was a mess when I'm trying to do developmental. And I had this baby I was taking care of. When you go to uh, the WW Training Center, was that in Orlando or was that in Tampa? It was in uh, Tampa. and. Uh, but you only trained for like two months before you had your first match with Natty. Do you think that was uh, the right time? to be in a ring or do you think well, okay. you needed a little so bit more training was, in that it was a little ring in a biker bar so back then okay so i've seen tv now and i've seen what the everyone's going through right now um with training and they it looks all nice they have air conditioning they have tvs and everything like they it's all fancy now where they train where we trained was a canning um warehouse with no air conditioning in florida over a hundred degrees no air in the whole place. And we had our practice matches at this biker bar. It was my first match and I felt like I was ready, but my memory didn't because whenever I get in the ring and our first spot was Natty had to slap me and slaps are real, you know? And so, and Natty, Natty just got back from Japan training. So she'd work at snow. She was really strong. And so, anyway, she slaps me, and it's the very beginning of the match, so I forget everything, because I just got slapped in the face. So, she was supposed to grab my arm, go off the ropes, I was supposed to duck her clothesline, school girl her up, or whatever. And so, I go off the ropes, that's all I remembered, <laughs> and she went, bam, clothesline you if you don't duck, and um, yeah, I basically just flailed around at that point, I was doing pretty bad. Okay, so your first match, you're at a biker bar, you're wrestling Natty, you forget the spot, she slaps the hell out of you. <laughs> but you're not in WWE for a long time. No, okay. So it was a very happened? short stay. What happened? Before I went to WWE, um, I went to Hermosa, okay? So the market crashes in Miami, I have a new baby, the dad moves to Hermosa Beach. He says, "You should." We're, we're, we broke up before the baby was even born, okay? Because I was like, oh, God, I'd never marry you. It was really fun, though. So anyway, he goes out to Hermosa, and he's like, you got to come here. It's so fun. And I'm like, okay. So, and to anybody that's listening, Hermosa Beach is about 10 miles from where I live. Oh, so it's, it's 10 so miles down beautiful. the road. Okay. Yeah, I love But it's it. in California, just right down the road. Yep. So I uh, go out to Hermosa. So this is right before Vince calls. I met my husband. The second day I arrived, I met the greatest guy I've ever met. Just all into charity, like big brother, big sisters, everything. I was like already in love. And so we were together for two weeks before Vince called. Okay. So when I'm out in Florida, I'm talking to him every other day and always trying to fly back out. And they want me to work on weekends. So he's flying out there. Or I'm making up some sort of excuse to come back to California. It was another weekend. They wanted us to work and go go wrestle or whatever. So I came out to California. I think I said, like, my grandma died or something. I completely lied because I really wanted to see my husband. So anyway, I came out and um, I said, I don't think I'm going to go back. Actually, I didn't tell him I was quitting. I told him they're going to give me a break for a couple months because they pay you for, like, three months. Even if you quit, they pay you for like three months after. So I told them, um, they're going to give me like a little break. So anyway, I basically, I just quit and called a them. And said, I don't want to do it. Yeah. yeah. And so then I, I, I told my husband eventually, oh God, like years later, because at, at that three months, when the three months was up, I was like, I think I'm just going to get a regular job and not wrestle because I just want to be with him. And then we had a baby. We were just a, such a 
family already, you know? And this was over 10 years ago. And we're still the best family and now three kids. <laughs> what? But then you decided that you wanted to get out, but then you ended up getting back in. So I was working a normal job as a... Um, I was a designer because I, yeah, I had the advertising company. And so then I was designing ads for um, TripAdvisor. And so I had my normal good job. And then uh, TNA called me after doing some funny Russellicious thing. Have you ever heard of Russellicious? Yes, I have. Okay. So I, actually, I didn't even know I was doing a show when I did Russellicious, by the way. They called me up one day and said, um, hey, do you want to do a music video? Uh, this is your lyrics. And it was like, hey, I'm Lacey Von Eric. You know the name. My family's from the Wrestling Hall of Fame. My claw hole's famous. It's not fictitious because Lacey Von Eric gets best delicious. So I thought that was really funny. So I go down the road that day. They give me 1500 bucks to sing this little song. And they tell me that day, hey, um, we're going to go to Florida and do a couple matches. And I was like, for the show. I said, what show? They're like, this is a TV show. And I said, y'all told me this is a music video. And I signed a contract for a music video, I thought. But I actually signed a contract for a TV show. I only went and shot a couple episodes in Florida, and that was it. But it was on TV, and it was online and everything. So that's where TNA saw me and called. And uh, I was working my job, and they faxed it to my job, like a contract to go TNA. And I was like, oh, it's so... This is way better than WWE because it's like every other week for two days at Universal Studios in Florida. Like, that sounds so fun. How tough could it be? Right. So I quit my job and I went to TNA. And it was the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. And I don't regret one day of it. And that's what happened. So how were you taken into the TNA locker room? Because they put you with beautiful people. Yes, and, and that was difficult at first. Okay, so they open open arms, happy when I get there, right? Well, then it was like a week later. I had a radio interview, and there. It, by the way, when I was at TNA, everyone talked shit about Angelina Love. Everybody, everyone said she was horrible, she was mean, she was this, she was that, and I was like, man, I never want to meet this girl. So anyway, which by the way, we're really good friends. So, and I don't know what they were talking about, but whatever. So I have a radio interview and I'm like, they're like, uh, how do you like Angelina Love? How, are you glad that you're replacing her and blah, blah, blah. Because she, she, you know, she was being deported. She got deported back to Canada okay, yeah. because of her visa. That's why they brought me in to fill her spot. Gotcha. And so I was like, no, I'm glad I never met her. Everyone hates her and all this stuff. <laughs> and TNA called me and they're like, Lacey, you can't say that. I'm like, y'all said that. <laughs> like, I've never even met her. <laughs> So anyway, Angelina comes back a week later. When I get there, she's back from Canada. And I already took her spot, one. And two, I just talked a lot of shit about her, and I didn't mean to, like they did. I see her, and I go, hey, sorry about the internet. <laughs> that was my first word. <laughs> well, what was your response to, well, you took her spot. She got deported, but then how did you guys become such good friends? Because there was no animosity? No. Or did you work I, through the animosity? And, I, we worked through it. Yeah. It took a little bit, but I don't give up <laughs> because, I don't know, I can get along with anyone. I just want to party and have fun with everyone when I was wrestling. That's all I wanted. And so we eventually had a lot of fun together. But was that your expectations out of getting into wrestling business? Because, you know. Honestly, I was just bored at work. I wanted to go back because I was bored. But they had you were married at the time, weren't you? Not yet. Not yet? Nope. We so were things, together four things at the years house, before we got married. So things at the house were good. But Jesus Christ, I mean, you're going back 10 years. You're only 31 sitting in front of me. So then you were 22, 23. Yep. Yeah. So you're still a kid. Yep. So you're, ready, you're still at Red Party, have fun. I'm still ready Drink to have beer, fun. whiskey, and have fun with the girls and the guys. Yeah. But TNA was way different than WWE. It was... Was it structured a little bit differently because... With with WWE and even even at that year that you were around, I mean it's very structured. It's very business oriented. Back when I was there, it was a little bit still wild wild west. You could do a lot of stuff and do things you wanted to do. The structure is pretty carved in stone. Was TNA run a little bit looser, kind of? We could do whatever we wanted. We just had to get there, do our hair and makeup, right. Do whatever we want during the day, then wrestle at night. And that was it. it was so fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we didn't see each other as much as the WWE people do. When, when you see each other that much and you travel together that much, it's like being with family. You're going to fight. You're going to get drama or whatever. We saw each other every two weeks for two days. We were like good friends. I mean, I wasn't in yet. I I had a lot of pushback when I got there. They expected a lot from me because I was a Von Eric. And that was really hard on me because... It's like I had that little bit of two month training at WWE and now, and no training at TNA. So I'm trying to do what they want me to, and I'm not perfect because they're like, you're a Von Eric, you should be perfect at this. Didn't you grow up wrestling? And I'm like, no, I grew up not talking about wrestling because everyone died. Like, why would I talk about wrestling in our family? It's a sore subject. Even when I was a wrestler and called my family that I was going to, some people didn't talk to me. Because wrestling was such a hard, sore subject. They're like, why would you go into a business? Everyone killed themselves in drug overdose. Why would you do that? And I said, I think this is the only way for me to cope with it. Because I had therapy and everything. And it did nothing. Because I didn't want to talk. And I think living the life and being in their shoes and being with the wrestlers and their friends like Terry or Hulk Hogan and stuff. And Ric Flair, man, he's my childhood. And one of my very good friends now we still text and talk all the time. He hasn't talked to me since he's been in the hospital, though, um, which I'm worried about. Rick. I talked to him just the other day. You did? How yeah. is he? He's, uh, we were laughing, and he's doing a lot better. Is he still in the hospital, or did he get he was, uh, he was in a different facility, but he's fixing to go home. Oh, good. Yeah, he's doing good. I talked to him just the other day. Did you worry at all, Lacey, that, hey, man, you know, the business brought a lot of demons out of your dad? Carrie had his demons. Um, yeah, they all or so did. it was rumored. And I wrestled your dad, you know, a few times right before he went to WWF. Wow, you seem I was, too young for that. Well, I, I was, I was, uh, but this was this was uh, I was twenty four, and just uh, stopped playing football at North Texas State, like your uncle Kevin played. No at. way! My whole family went to North Texas yeah. on my so, mom's side too. Well, if you remember when I was talking to you on the phone, I told you, you know, uh, the Von Erics. And for anybody that doesn't know, and almost everybody around the world knows, but the Von Erics. Uh, well, first of all, it was one of the greatest family wrestling dynasties in the history of professional wrestling. You know, number one, arguably. And, man, I grew up on Houston wrestling down there when I was a kid, watching Dusty and watching Paul Bosch's promotion. And I got a chance to play football at North Texas State, and that was based out of Denton, Texas. This was 1986 and 1987. Territory was on its way down. It was really peaking in 83 through 85. And uh, the business was crazy. The Von Ecks were rock stars. I was just breaking in, and sometimes a guy wouldn't show up on the card. So I'd wrestle Kerry for like five minutes. He'd give me one or two spots maybe, and then they'd put the iron claw on me, and that was it. Same thing with Kevin. You know, one or two high spots, you know, a little bit of heat, and then, you know, iron claw, I'm out. <laughs> so yeah, that was winning. my memory. You know, a lot of times, that one time I was going to a spot show, I think it was in Cleburne, Texas, and uh, I'm stopping, I'm getting some gas, I'm driving a 1976 Monte Carlo, and I look over across a gas station, you know, parking lot, and there's this big dude jacked up in a pair of trunks, Putting gas in his car. It's your dad, Carrie Von Eric, <laughs> putting gas in his car. I mean, the show's going to start in like two, three hours. He's wearing his, his shit in, in the gas station before he even gets to the building. Oh, so when you started thinking about getting in the business, or you did, started with WWE, you got out. You sign up for the Russellicious, then you go to TNA. Hey, I didn't know partying. I signed up for Russellicious. I know, but you got to go, Lacey, you got to learn how to read the, read the fine print. <laughs> But were you worried, like, hey, man, this kind of led to the demise of a lot of my family members. I need to stay out of this because, no. like you just said, you had therapy. I'm too headstrong. No. I stay away from drugs or anything like that. I just love my beer, and I like to have fun. I know how to handle myself. I just, I'm mentally really strong. My dad and my uncles, a lot of people don't know that they grew up in a very tough house. Granddad was not the nicest of dads. What do you remember about Fritz? Well, he was the best granddad in the whole world. And everywhere we went, he'd go, here we is. And so I do now. Um, and, uh, I mean, I remember just growing up on the farm, and he would always put us in the buckets of his tractor. And I know, like, my granddad, right? But my Mimi had told me, you know, who he was divorced from, told me a lot of the stories of how the boys grew up, and it's not wrestling that killed them. 
It really isn't. It was it was their upbringing and their mental. It, that's hard to talk about because I wrote a book about it and um, it's going to be coming out. And I it's it's a lot of the secrets and stuff that people don't know about how they grew up and how Granddad was to the guys. And I know Uncle Kevin, if he's listening to this, um, would would be really sad and everything to hear that I know the truth about what happened. And it's really sad. Right now, I mean, like, like again, you're, you're 31. Now that you've processed all this, you went to therapy, you've written your book, it's going to come out. And just like I said at the beginning of the podcast, for a while, or like when you would make a phone call, y'all would never talk about wrestling because it brought so much misery to your family. And with yeah. the glory, it brought misery with all the deaths, with all the drugs, with, with everything that happened. When you look back at everything from, shoot, David, Mike, Chris, Carrie, Jackie was a verse, but that was but way before. Six. Yeah, he was yeah. six. Like, what, what, how do you process all that? Like, was David, was that truly enteritis or was it a, a drug overdose? Did you think, did Uncle David OD or, I mean, that was a rumor? I mean, in our family, we consider all of them having drug overdoses and suicides. None of us think that anything was an accident. We just don't. And suicide is hereditary. It, it's a brain, it's a chemical imbalance. And all of the things that happened to them would trigger that. And I, you know, a lot of, a lot of mental problems that people have in society now are not addressed. And I think that in these days, they would have been able to have drugs to cope with them a little better. I myself am on Zoloft because I don't want that to happen to me, you know? And so I, w I wish they had something. I wish they had someone to talk to. I wish they had a drug that was not a bad drug that would help them with their brain and their thoughts and things like that. You're listening to another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Of course you would. And when it comes to great rates on insurance, Geico can help, like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners or renters coverage. Plus, add an easy-to-use mobile app, available 24-hour roadside assistance, and more. And Geico is an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you could save. It's simple. Go to geico.com or contact your local agent today. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Hey, what do you remember about the Sportatorium? Because what I remember about that building, it was one of the greatest buildings of all time. I, I can never forget it. I remember being pretty dirty. Smell like stale smell beer, like piss, hot dogs, hamburgers, smell like blood, french fries sweat, and, and urine. Uh, it smelled like french fries and funnel cakes to me. Um, because the french fry man was me and my sister's favorite guy. Do you remember the french fry man? Yeah. He'd like cut them himself, everything. So we'd always hang out with him. He'd help us. He'd let us uh, make french fries. And then do you remember the wall for the kids that you'd go do the fishing rod? Yeah. And you, yeah. So I remember that. And then me and the family had to stay behind the cage. Yeah. The crow's nest. Is that what they call yeah, it? Yeah. That's what me and Mick Foley called it. I remember uh, I first started and I was a baby face. Like I said, I just got finished playing with North Texas, that long blonde hair, almost like yours, believe it or not. Down the middle of my back and uh, my brother came to support me, my brother Kevin, and he was the one that would really follow my wrestling career. And we walked in, I was going to get him in for free, which is a big deal when you ain't got no money. And we walked by the uh, the vending area right there, right there when you come in those doors that everybody walked through. And hell, it was 9 a.m. because we started the show, I believe, at 10, 10 or 11, but we were there early, first guys in the building. And there's a guy behind the concession stands. It was me and my brother. I was walking him to his seat. And the guy goes, two beers? And my brother Kevin said, God dang. Yeah, two beers. So my brother took the two beers, went and sat and watched wrestling matches. He fell in love with Sportatorium because, because the guy was already selling beer at 9 a.m. in the morning. My brother was hooked. He <laughs> liked to come to Dallas to watch me get the shit kicked out of me. I love it was when you have no money. There's always enough for a beer. <laughs> the, that's just the way life works out. <laughs> There's always a silver lining and a dark cloud. <laughs> Are you in contact with your mother? Yeah. I talked to my mom. So she sobered up two years ago. What do you guys uh, do for <laughs> holidays or Christmas or anything special? I can't say family or union because, you know, everybody's gone. Well, we have a huge family on my mom's side. Okay. Because um, that's part of the family you never hear about. 
because right. it was all the Von Eric boys. Well, and then we have the Simpsons on the other side. My Aunt Barbie married Sean Simpson. Oh. Yeah. And Sean and Steve Simpson. You remember they, that? Yeah, log, South good African. looking dude, oh, South so Africa. Cute. And then they, uh, oh man, those guys were over like big time. I'm second to the Von Erics, but they were over. Good looking guys, mm-hmm. baby faces. I heard they got in the mattress business. Yeah. So they just sold it and okay. retired from that. And they live out by the lake, Lake Palestine now. Yeah, and Steve and Sean Simpson. I'll never forget them. So we have it on both sides. Mm. <laughs> and so my Uncle Sean and my Aunt Barbie were kind of like my parents. They lived in one house next to us, and that's where I met, learned all my values, learned how to be a wife, learned how to be a mom, everything from Aunt Barbie and Uncle Sean. And Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin, because I was at their house every weekend. Like, they were my other family, for sure. And, uh, yeah, so now Thanksgiving uh, for holidays, we go out to Lake Palestine. They have two lake houses next to each other, and so our family kind of splits up, and we stay in the two houses and have a huge Thanksgiving out there. And then I usually spend Christmas with my husband's family out here. So are you close with Kevin? Yeah. uh, I mean, he lives in Hawaii, so it's hard to see him. Uh, But I talk to him all the time via text, and, you know, he hates talking on the phone. Um, my cousin Jill has been my best friend since I was born, which is his daughter. And so we talk all the time and she has three little girls. They're so beautiful. Um, and they all live on a huge compound he bought a bunch of land. There's all these houses. And so my cousin Kristen and Ross and Marshall and everyone lived in a different house on the same piece of land with a river running through it. It's so gorgeous. What was going on with your dad in retrospect and and talking with Kevin or Kathy, his former wife, where he was at when he decided that he would take his life after he'd had all the warrants. Well, you know, he was writing scripts. We got arrested with Daddy a lot. Remember how you mentioned Chris Adams? Yeah. The last time he got arrested was right outside of Chris Adams' house with us. Um, So we always got split up. This always happened, literally. (laughs) Like, So we all get arrested together. It was me, my dad, and my sister. So my dad would go in one car, me and my sister were in another car, we'd be banging on the door, cussing at the cops, flicking them off. That's what we did. We were so little, too, or like six-year-old little girls. Anyway, and we'd go into uh, the sheriff's office and color, and we could see all the monitors, and daddy knew we could see him on the monitors. He still would make it funny. He'd be making faces at the monitors, mooning the monitors, everything, because he knew we could see them. And so it ended up making us laugh. And Annie would come pick us up. We'd wake up somewhere strange the next day. So anyway, we knew something was coming, right? So they told he sold cocaine a lot, right? And so Your they dad told, did? yeah. So they said the judge said the next time I see you in here, you're going to prison. So he got arrested again. He knew he was going to prison. All his brothers died except one, and me and my sister were taken away from him, and we were very close. So, I don't blame him. I just don't. I just, I don't know what I would do. You know, the thing uh, that was really so strange about that, and throughout my career in North Texas, you know, I would be listening to the radio and I'd hear, okay, Gino had left, Gino died, you know, uh, David died. Uh, All these guys, I always kept hearing this on the radio. And then when when I look back, because now... You know, it's 2017. I'm 52. You know, I was there in Dallas and then 86, 87 in Denton and then breaking into business in 89, 90. Then I went on to Tennessee and then WCW and then throughout my career. But when I look at everything that Kerry accomplished, when he shot himself, when he committed suicide, he was 33 years old. He was still a baby, but he was... On he, he was this global superstar that everybody looked up to. I thought he'd been around for 20 years because I had grown up with the Von Erichs. And I thought, man, when I started doing the timeline, I was thinking, you know, Kerry was probably 40 when he committed suicide. No, he was 33. And, and it's just unbelievable that he accomplished so much. They were such a huge impact on everybody in Texas and then really around the world because of the way their TV was bootlegged. And I was certainly a hero that I looked up to, and I couldn't believe that he had left this world at 33 years of age. That is so young. Because he had lived the life that he had to me, when, when I look back at it, and I didn't process it this way back when, when, I, when it happened, it was like, man, he was such a, he was an old soul and a young body. 
And he, when, he, when he had his run in WWE, WWF at the time, he looked like he was 38, you know, but, and just because of my perception of him, that he'd been around for so long, I just had him being that old. The guy hadn't really reached his peak years as far as what we normally would do inside the squared circle. So, I don't know, it's a weird conversation because I can see your eyes sharing up as we're talking. And I was watching uh, Bill Mercer talk about this on the, uh, I was watching on the WWE Network, the rise and fall of world, world class championship wrestling. It brought a tear to my eye to, to look at, you know, Kevin, you know, wrapping the thing up saying like, you know, people think that I've had a tough life. He goes, I've had a great life. He goes, all my friends and all my brothers are gone. But, you know, we got to spend 25 he years together. always so positive, though. Like, I grew up at their house. And Uncle Kevin was so happy and positive throughout my whole time. He's very, he's very much a hippie. I know he wouldn't call himself. He's absolutely 100% a hippie. Doesn't like to wear shoes. Only wears shirts with holes in them. Slides his feet everywhere he goes because he's had so many knee surgeries. And is always has a happy smile and like loves nature and like he always showers if it's raining outside. He he goes outside to shower because he loves the rain. He spear fishes all the time in Hawaii. He's just he's just one with nature. He's one with himself. He's just very much content with life and how things are supposed to happen. And he's very spiritual and. Yeah, with he doesn't have the mentality my other uncles had in life and everything else. He he's learned to cope with it by just being so like just calm. And I mean, a lot of people could learn from that. It's, even me. I mean, I just, sometimes the way the way he phrases things is like, man, that's an interesting way to look at it. That's an interesting perspective. He he okay. just has some some. I, I should have written some of them down. Just the the way that he thinks. I don't know. He just. He's like that guy that you would go to who's been through it all to ask for some advice because, well, he has been through it all. Yeah, yeah. When I told him that uh, me and Brooke Hogan and Ariel and Brittany Page and stuff was thinking about starting an all-girls wrestling federation, he was like, baby girl, that's what he always called me, are you sure you want to get back in this business? <laughs> <laughs> the all-girl wrestling federation, is that still... On the books, well, Brooke Hogan trying? actually texted me before while I was on the way here. I said, "What? What kind of tell them about it? Because a lot of it's a secret." We're working hard on getting the girls a platform. That's our our girls. We're finalizing who's going to be in the league and deciding what kind of live shows we're going to be doing. Possibly a tour, um, house shows, and in one spot. It's all going to be girls, and then all the owners are me and Brooke Hogan, Ariel Piper, and. Brittany Page. We're the daughters of wrestling. We've been in it our whole life. I'm the only one that's actually wrestled. So I'll be helping train the girls. I want to bring everything back to how it used to be. Like when my dad and stuff, and when they started wrestling, right? Not how it is now with the girls. I think they look too um, choreographed. I want it to be, I want them to get hurt. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like... I don't want to. I don't want them to hold back. They're gonna hurt a little bit, but they'll be okay. I mean, I want Ronda Rousey to come in and and show them how real wrestling is, and then we'll just, you know, we'll just kind of back it off just a little bit. When when you say about you know women's wrestling today, what well, the business has changed. Man, mm -hmm. the, the the girls these days are they're, they're kicking ass pretty damn good. Yeah. When I think of... The, well, the, I don't watch it. Maybe I should watch it. you got to watch it. I mean, the, the, the women in WWE have taken it to another level. But oh, really? When you talk about a physical... How long have you not been watching? I think I was just... Oh, back at TNA when I was at TNA. Oh, you know what? But that was a whole generation removed from what's going on today. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So if you tune back in, they've really taken it to a, an unbelievable level of athleticism and stuff that they're, 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 they're doing. Heard, so I'm obsessed with American Ninja Warrior. And I heard that one of the girls, I forget her name. Casey. I'll mess Casey. up her last name. Cataranzo. Yes. She's amazing. Yes, she was so on that, my show. I'm going to start tuning in because she's my favorite girl on American Ninja Warrior. And so. They've really taken it to a crazy level and they're, they're really done awesome. But, you know, when I think back and, uh, you know, I was listening to Kevin talk about the physicality of the Freebirds and the Von Erics. Those guys were beating the shit out of each other. And it's like they were saying in the interview, 
We tried to not knock each other's teeth out, not break any bones, but other than that, it was pretty much fair game. what I want the girls to do. Well, that'd be great. That'd be great. I'm but, not but, wrestling, though. So. But that's what, but that's, that, but and, and that's what Kevin was saying. You know, he goes, "Hey, I laid my stuff, and I work snug." Some people would say stiff, which kind of way I, I like to work as well. I like stiff. But they were beating the hell out of each other, and that that was part of the thing that was so on fire. Again, when I was around in the sport tournament, it started tapering off, and then eighty nine ninety, it was starting to die in that neck of the woods. But man, that action in world class championship wrestling, you know, when all the Von Erichs were really running strong, was super physical. I mean, if you'd have told somebody it was fake, they'd have said, you're shitting me. This, this ain't real because you thought it was. Well, pretty much was, right? When you get baseball slid out, you do. When you get slapped, you do. I, I ask the girls sometimes, you just lay it on a little harder. Don't, don't, if you don't hit me, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell it. I'm not because it looks like shit and it makes me look like shit if I fall down for your crap. And they didn't like that. But I was like, I'm a Von Erich. I can't just come out here and then just do this shit. And I felt like that at TNA. Even though I love TNA so much, I did feel like my dumbass character and the way I had to wrestle sucked. And honestly, with this league, I want redemption. But now, do you do you think it was because at 21 years of age, I mean, you're a baby. I mean, you're, still, you're a young lady. 31 is still a very young person. But at 21... You might not have been as serious as you needed to have been or maybe able to grasp the situation at hand. Do you think with now, maybe at a more mature level, at yeah, 31, a different mindset that you would approach the business differently? Absolutely. Yes, of course. I approached all of life differently. So, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like, like I always say, man, if I could go back and do it again, knowing what I know now, God dang, I'd have been a whole lot better. So I guess that's true from anyone's perspective. Yeah, I guess so. with, with, with experience and the age comes wisdom, but you have to be able to soak it up and use it. So I did okay, but if I could go back and do it knowing what I know now, You're I probably could good. achieve the higher level. But, you know, <laughs> but at 21, you know, I think you went in. and You were I mean, my favorite character. You know how bad I wanted to smash beers? And drink beer while they think they want to let me. <laughs> you know what? It was so much fun, you know, going down to the sportatorium back in the day and watching those guys and then, you know, end up training in that ring in the sportatorium and then making my debut. And then it took me, you know, years to really get a handle on everything. And then for a while, you know, I wanted to be Ric Flair because I thought Ric Flair was like the greatest wrestler as far as wrestling goes. And... I tried to emulate his style. It didn't work out so well for me. And then it took getting dropped on my head, changing my style, coming up with the final gimmick. Everything is kind of a work in process and everything is, you know, a transition period and you have to be willing to experiment. And I was and to finally come up with the Stone Cold character that I created. But yeah, it, it, it didn't happen overnight for me. Right. But it, it was funny because I got a chance to kind of watch, you know, your dad and all the brothers just kind of like, like Kevin was saying, everybody had a gimmick. Our gimmick was we weren't a gimmick. We were, you know, the Von Erich boys. Mm -hmm. And not being, a, not being a gimmick or not having a gimmick was the gimmick. They just were themselves. They and asked me. That's why People Texas and America me, fell in love with them. What were you in wrestling? I was like, Lazy Von Erich. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> I didn't really, I mean, I did the beautiful people or whatever, but I don't know. You want to hear my Ric Flair story? Yeah. Okay, here. It starts with a scar. You see this horrible scar right here? Where, oh, the one you buy us up? Yep. Yeah. Right there. That's muscle. horrible. Yeah. You know why? Okay, so we're in we're in uh, Australia. I'm on the Hulkamania tour. I did a swimsuit like thing one night and whatever, but I had too many fans there, and they were like, you got to be in the main show with Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. Or Rick and Hogan actually came up to me and said, hey, you got to be in the show with us. I said, okay. So I was Ric Flair's manager. And so, because they wanted to be controversial because the Von Eric and Flair had like this rivalry. Now I was with Ric Flair, so we were the bad guys. Yeah. Right? Anyway, we did the same spot every night. It was 10 days in Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, and Perth. Same spot every night. Rick grabs my arm, pulls me in front of him, pushes me in front of Hogan. I bear hug him. He punches him in the face, right? So... Rick keeps his blade on his middle finger and never has a manager. <laughs> Hogan keeps his in his mouth, which is ridiculous. How do you even talk? I, I don't get it. So Rick grabs me and pulls me in front of him. 
I look, I, and I bear hug Hogan, right? I look to my right, and blood is squirting like a waterfall out of my arm. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> and uh, and Hogan, he's like, it's okay, baby. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the beginning of the show in front of 20,000 people. And then I have to, like, climb up on the second rope. Mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart comes and pulls my dress down. I just have lingerie. I have to jump into the ring and headlock Hogan. And so we're down on the ground. They've already gigged the shit out of themselves. So they're completely bloody everywhere. I'm bleeding. And all I say to Hogan, like, as I'm... As I'm headlocking him, is you better not have AIDS. You better not have AIDS. <laughs> and he's like, I don't, baby. I don't. <laughs> and the Hulk Hogan, no, baby. Uh, no, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, baby. I don't. So then I run backstage when it's all done and I go over to the ambulance and I'm like, can you fix me up? And they were like, oh, we're fake. They didn't even have a band aid. <laughs> they were fake for the show. <laughs> So I get my sweatshirt and I tie my arm up and I go back to the hotel. And I'm like, do y'all have like band-aids or anything? And so they have band-aids. So I take the ends of band-aids, cut them, and had to butterfly myself up. And that's why you have the hideous scar on your right bicep. I love that scar. Even, it's a great story to get a scar. Even Rick said, I will get you plastic surgery fixed. I was like, are you kidding me? This is the best scar I have. Well, you're talking about two of the biggest names in the history of wrestling. If you're working with Hogan and Flair and you get a scar <laughs> of the deal, yeah, it's kind of a win. Yeah. And then here's I get my, to bring up the story when everyone sees it. Well, here's my Flair story. <laughs> it was right before I walked out of the company because I didn't want to uh, do this program with Brock Lesnar because they wanted to beat me on TV with no buildup. And there was amazing money to be made there and a bit of amazing pay-per-view. And I love Brock Lesnar. I, I was running hard, not making great decisions. And I got the creative call and I didn't like it. And so I was going to call Vince that night. So this was in Columbus, Georgia on a Sunday. And I'm working with the one and only Ric Flair in a cage that night. And we're working Monday Night Raw in Atlanta the next day. That's the Raw I would no-show. So anyway, back to the match. Back to the story with Flair. Back to the razor blade on the middle finger. We're having a match. You know, I just told Rick, hey, man, call it in the ring. Because I don't hear very well, so I call 99% of my matches. And I just, I'm in Rick's hands, so I'm going to listen to the greatest of all time. <laughs> and I'm going to have fun. And we're having a blast. And we're in a cage. And all of a sudden, that tape comes off. And I'm bleeding. I got uh, from my arms, from my chest. He scratched you that much? Yeah, he scratched oh the shit out of me. God. I thought I got in a fight with the damn alley cat. Oh, no. But it's Ric Flair, so who really gives a shit? Oh, no. It was great. I had a blast. And then, Do you, you have know, scars from that? No, just little bitty scars. It didn't, it didn't like, get you deep like me? Oh, no, it didn't get me deep, but I had just little <laughs> spots of blood everywhere. I'm like, God damn, it's like working with Edward Scissorhands over here. <laughs> I'm so glad someone else experienced it. You had to hear the story when they did, um, let's go back to the David Von Erich Memorial uh, match where Kerry won the title from Nature Boy Ric Flair. And this was, you know, in memory of David. That was Stadium. Yeah. About forty or 50,000 people show up. Have you seen the match back on YouTube? No. Oh, yes. And I and I have the pictures on my phone of Daddy backstage because uh, I used to look at him all the time. But, yeah, it's amazing. Man, all these fans, they know, they remember these amazing matches. They remember these things about daddy. And I'm like, my story of daddy is not matches. And we hated wrestling. We hated him wrestling. We cry every time. But what you want him to do? It was kayfabe, by the way. Right. He didn't even tell my mom or us that it wasn't real. <laughs> like, we were crying our eyes out all the time. And we were always in the hospital because daddy would get the same spot in his eyebrow every freaking time. So he's constantly getting stitches. So we're always going to the hospital afterwards. It's like, why do you do this? <laughs> like, to us, he was always losing. <laughs> so. What do you spend your days doing now? Because I hear you're ahead of the PTA. I know you have three wonderful kids. <laughs> like, how do you occupy your day uh, if you're not getting this wrestling thing going uh, with the women? Right. And you're living out in Westlake Village. How do you occupy your time, and what are you interesting and pursuing? Because Jesus, like you said, you're you're only a pup. You're 31 years old. Thank you. Well, I've been with my husband 10 years. Got my three kids. Got a ton of pets. I wake up every morning. I go to boot camp, and then I'm home by 6:30 in the morning after boot camp, and I uh, feed all my pets. I'm the room moms for both their classes. Like, so anything the classes need for school, I'm the PTA mom, so I do everything for the school and run their fundraisers every month. 
and uh, shop. <laughs> and uh, give me a look. <laughs> <laughs> a little too much shopping. I mean, honestly, whenever Brooke and them called me about doing a wrestling federation, I'm like, when am I going to tr- do that? But then I was like, you know what? I am really young, and I am spending all my time just you know, finding ways to get in the kids' lives and and always be in their class. And I'm the managers for all of their teams and everything. I do everything. And so I think it'll be fun to shake it up a little bit. I'm the epitome of a separate mom right now. <laughs> Is that good? I love it. Give me a happy story because there, there was so much tragedy with with y'all's family. But give me a, give me a happy story. Oh, Daddy? Or, yeah, or anything that brings a smile to your face. My dad used to always sing, this is a song that never ends. It goes on in all my friends. And be really annoying and do that for an hour. That was really fun. Um, he was a really bad cook, so he would burn everything. So we'd always come back to his apartment with it black and the milk alarms going off. And that was fun. It actually was fun. All these bad things that would happen when he'd take us out of school we need to kidnap us. That was the most fun thing ever. He would, he would sneak in our beds and say, come on, girls. So we'd go, and we'd have the best time in the car. We'd go to Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin's house and play with all my cousins. Me and my cousins used to go outside and mud wrestle. We loved mud wrestling. Uh, and so we, and then we'd run through the house, my Aunt Pam would chase us. Um, no, I have great memories. Most of the best memories I have in my life are at Aunt Pam and Uncle Kevin. And they know that. They're my, they're my happiest part. Thank you for joining us for another classic episode of The Steve Austin Show. Please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends. For more Steve Austin Show, go to podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. This February on Pluto TV, we're putting the spotlight on iconic black talent. Watch your favorite movies like Top 5, 48 Hours, and More Than a Game. And drop in to binge black TV classics like The Bernie Mac Show and Moesha. Pluto TV has hundreds of channels and thousands more movies and TV shows all for free. So download the Pluto TV app on your favorite streaming device and start watching today. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. Yo, what's good? It's your boy, Big Brother Jake, a.k.a. Jake Warner. My government name. Check it out. I host a show called the Big Brother Jake Podcast, and I'm taking my talents to the biggest and baddest platform on the planet. That's right, baby. Podcast One. My show is unique as I talk about everything. Life, 